Okay, in today's lesson, we're actually going to cover two sections, uh, chapter 15-3 and 15-4. We're going to talk about women's rights and the uh, American art and literature scene that begins to blossom in the 1840s and 1850s. All right? Now, to begin with, let's talk about some of those uh, women's rights. You remember uh, the Grimke sisters from the last lesson? Remember, they're abolitionists. You know, they're, you know, they want to end slavery. But they find that they are not allowed to speak. Men don't want to listen to them. They don't want to listen to a woman speaking. So the Grimke sister, sisters start to believe, hey, man, are we fighting for the wrong things? You know, um, obviously we think slavery is wrong. But what about the rights of women? So you start to see some people come on scene to really start to challenge the establishment you know, of a man-dominated uh, society. You know, they start to think that women should have the same rights as men. If you look at uh, society in America, and actually in Europe too, at this time, you're going to find that there's a lot of discrimination against women. Um, you know, women could not vote, obviously. They could not hold office. You know, when a woman got married, whatever she owned belonged to her husband. If she works outside the office, or outside the house, I'm sorry, uh, any wages that she gets belongs to her husband. Oh my gosh. Men could even beat their their wives, as long as they didn't cause serious injury. Have you ever heard of the rule of thumb? Rule of thumb is, you know, you can uh, you can smack your wife around with a stick as long as it wasn't bigger than uh, bigger around than your thumb. I mean, these are <laughs> we look at it today as as barbaric, as uh, as unbelievable. But this was the life that women lived in, uh, and be, and became accustomed to. The other thing that's interesting to me is, you know, at the beginning. And I, I've mentioned this in other lectures, that a lot of women at that time did not support the equal rights movement. They didn't. You know, they they felt that politics and business and earning a living was a man's job. And that women should be at home taking care of the family and taking care of the their husband. So at the beginning, even women, uh, to a large degree, don't support the women's right movement. But it, it's going to grow. One of the most interesting women's rights uh leaders was an African-American woman named Sojourner Truth. Okay, that's not a real name. Her real name was Isabella. She had escaped from slavery, and she goes to speak just kind of like the Grimke sisters. But again, she faces discrimination many people don't want to hear. So she determines that, you know, or she believes that God has sent her to, um, to spread the truth. So she's going to sojourn, which means to travel and spread the truth. Now, not a lot of the stuff that she wrote was written down, but, you know, uh, what we hear about Sojourner Truth is she's a very powerful speaker and really did a lot towards, uh, you know, moving public opinion towards women's rights. Another very famous uh, women's rights activist was uh, Lucretia Mott. She was a Quaker. You know, uh, Quakers are tend to be kind of quiet people, humble people, and she kind of holds up to that idea of a Quaker woman. She's quiet. But, you know, um, she wins a lot of respect because she speaks very eloquently and very persuasive. Her her logic, you know, is, it's tough to argue with. And she's also very good at organizing people, organizing women to sign petitions. And they set up these petitions for women's rights all over the North. One of the most famous of all, though, is Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, Katie Stanton, okay? Now, she's interesting. I mean, she was born to a, uh, a father who was a lawyer, owned a law office. Um, she really kind of detested a lot of the things that women were forced to do. She hated to sew. Uh, she spent a lot of time playing sports and running around. Uh, she's kind of, kind of a tomboy. And um, though she did not receive a lot of encouragement from her father. In fact, she even says, you know, my dad would have been much prouder of me if I'd been a man. But uh, Stanton and Mott both together are abolitionists. And again, as you might well imagine, um, they're not welcome into the abolitionist movement. In fact, in 1840, they uh, joined a group of, uh, of people uh, at the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. Now, can you imagine, you know, they're there, and they're like, uh, they walk in the door, and everyone's head turns and goes, oh, it's women, oh my gosh. Now, uh, the convention officials refused to let the women even, you know, take part in the uh, in the conference. Uh, in fact, the female delegates that were able to attend were forced to sit behind a curtain. 
so the men wouldn't even have to see them. Oh my gosh. So, you know, they return back to the United States and they go, we are, we, you know, slavery's wrong. We agree with that. And we uh, want to end slavery. But we really need to start thinking about fighting for women's rights. So once Mott and Stanton returned to the United States, you know, they said, you know what we need? We need a convention. A convention that draws attention to the problems that women face. All right? So this convention is going to meet in Seneca Falls, New York. All right? And they write a constitution or a declaration of, um, what do they call it? Declaration of Sentiments. And it's kind of modeled after our own Declaration of Independence. And if you remember, in the Declaration of Independence, we see that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, they changed that. And they, you know, they proclaim that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And what they want to do is they want to demand equality for women at work, at school, at churches. Um, there's about 200 women there, and they're accompanied by 40 men. 40 men who actually said, hey, you know something, uh, women should have the rights uh, like men. All right, but the one item on the agenda, the one that's very controversial is that women should be allowed to vote. You know, even these uh, very, uh, uh, the most liberal people at this convention are like, eh, I don't know about that one now. Okay, so, you know, a lot of debate. They don't know if they should push their luck. Should they really, really try to push for the right to vote? Well, uh, the resolution passes narrowly, you know, that women should have the right to vote. However, as you guys should know, and it's written right here on the screen for you, Women do not get the right to vote until 1920. It hasn't even been 100 years that women in America have had the right to vote. That's amazing to me. Okay, so that, you know, that uh, convention at Mount Holy, I mean, at, uh, at um, um, Seneca Falls is going to last, you know, for many years. It's the beginning of the Equal Rights Movement for women. <coughs> One of the most important leaders, and you guys may have heard of her, is Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony. Now, Stanton actually had a lot of kids, so she couldn't travel around as much, but Susan, Susan B. Anthony was able to go out and spread the message across all of America. You know, she meets a lot of opposition people, you know, heckler, throw things at her, but she always finishes her speeches, and she does a great job. Um, but uh, again, this, you know, that uh, convention at Seneca Falls really start, is the beginning of the equal rights movement, um, but as you know... Um, that right to vote is going to continue for about 70 more years. Remember, that's in 1848. Women don't get the right to vote till 1920. And at the beginning, as I, I need to say this again, they don't have a lot of support for men or women. Okay, the Seneca Falls Convention really starts talking about, you know, one of the most important things is education and opportunities for women. Now, poor women, if you're a girl born to a poor family, your chances of getting education is slim Slim at best, all right? Even middle-class uh, girls, girls from middle-class families, they're going to go to school, they're going to learn to dance, to draw, sew. You know, they're not going to learn science, they're not going to learn math, you know, or foreign languages. You know, uh, remember, what, what do people expect women to do? To take care of families, to be kind of a social uh, organizer, you know, having dances and cotillions and balls and charity events. They don't need to learn math and science. That's up to men, all right? So they start to change that idea that women should have the same opportunities as men to learn, you know, advanced, um, you know, curriculums. So Mount Holyoke is probably the first woman's college. First woman's college. It opens in 1837. At first, they don't even call it a college because uh, many people are like, why are women going to college? They shouldn't be doing that. But, you know, that is going to become the, the first women's college. And we have women's colleges today. Right here in Omaha, we have College of St. Mary's. It's a private institution, so they can set the rules. And uh, women are the only people that can go to, you know, these these kinds of colleges, all right? Give an opportunity for women. And the first one is Mount Holyoke. You know, uh, it's also very tough. You know, they're not going to, you know, traditional colleges, you know, that have been around for, you know, for quite some time. You know, they're not going to admit women at first. But as women begin to get this opportunity in lower grades, like in, uh, you know, elementary schools and in high schools where they're learning math and sciences, you know, these colleges begin to reluctantly allow women in. And one of the earliest careers that women can go into is teaching. 
teaching, all right? Uh, of course, they're going to be teaching primary grades, you know, kindergarten, first, second, third grades, things like that. For advanced, you know, education, still going to be a man's world, but you start to see women making it inroads into teaching and even into medicine. And if you think about medicine, it seems natural. Women have always been taking care of uh, the sick when they're, you know, in their families, um, during wars. Uh, they have gone, you know, to take care of the men when they're injured. So it's a natural, to me, a natural field for women to go into. But women were not allowed to earn medical degrees. The first one was, a na her name was Elizabeth Blackwell. She attended a medical school at Geneva College in New York. And guess what? She finishes first in her class. Shocked everybody because they didn't think she could do it at all. Right, so you start to see women start to make some inroads into medicine. All right, so there you have it. You have some uh, of the women that are, you know, the struggles that women have. They're not going to be supported by by very many men, and even a lot of women. All right, but women it starts with kind of with uh, the abolitionist movement, where these women are not welcomed into the abolitionist uh, groups. They start to fight for their equal rights. The first, you know, convention, the Seneca Falls Convention. And you start to see gradual improvements, but it's going to be a long struggle. Okay, let's talk about the next part of a lesson. All right, this is uh, chapter 15-4 in your books if you're following along. So, you know, at the beginning of our country, you know, the struggles of, you know, uh, hacking our way out of a wilderness, uh, people's attentions really aren't turning to the arts. You know, in the 1700s and even the early 1800s, you know, nobody's reading American authors. Nobody is buying American artwork, right? Even Americans aren't buying it. You know, uh, rich people, they're going to buy their art from Europeans. You know, the, the novels they read are usually written by Europeans, especially the English, all right? So, but you begin to see a shift where Americans are beginning to, you know, prosper as begin, you know, as Americans begin to prosper and they start moving towards cities, urbanization begins to set up, museums are set up, and it inspires people to start studying the arts. And you begin to see kind of this growth of American painters and authors and poets. So if you, you know, and you're in the 1700s or early 1800s, if you did, you know, want to become a painter and you want to learn how to become a great artist, well, you're not going to go to school in America. You're going to travel to Europe. And so you start to see a couple of these guys begin to travel to Europe to be trained by the European masters. All right? Some of these people start to return home. Um, uh, and they begin to set up what's called the Hudson River School. The Hudson River School is at the Hudson River is in New York, as you guys remember. And uh, you start to see a style of painting develop. Now, I apologize for my slide here. I'm not quite sure exactly what happened. It translated kind of wrong. But you start to see more of a natural scene. Okay, As the painters are admiring the scenery around the Hudson River, they begin to paint it. This looks pretty natural. This one, even though you can barely see it, is pretty good. This one's okay. Now, how about this one? Now, I've been up the Hudson River, and I don't remember anything like this. So it's kind of a stylized vision of maybe what he saw and then, you know, translated into more of artistic uh, vision of what he saw himself. You're also going to see this kind of uh, infatuation with the Native American tribes where now artists are going to travel west. They're going to, you know, study the Native Americans, start painting them, what their life was like. They're going to go to the Rockies, start painting scenery of the Rockies and of the American landscape. All right, so you start to see this blossoming of American painters during this time. Okay, so you also start to see poets come on the scene. You know, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, you know, if you guys have ever heard, you know, listen, my children, and you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere. All right, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a lot of his poems based on, you know, uh, heroic events during the Revolutionary War. So he's still well known today. Um, now, Walt Whitman, though, he's a little bit different. He didn't really write... He only wrote one poetry book, and the poetry book was called Leaves of Grass. Now, he added to this collection of poems for like 27 years, all right? But he celebrated democracy. He really liked the idea that America was a nation of nations, all right? So this is kind of reflected in his work. But most of you guys should know Emily Dickinson, 
Emily Dickinson. She was a very interesting person. She was almost a recluse. She was very shy. Uh, she she stayed at home. She never ventured out. Um, in fact, uh, I think only um, were it's like seven poems were ever published in her life, and she wrote, you know, well over a thousand poems. Um, she's really not going to be discovered and recognized for the genius that she was until after her death. But uh, today she's recognized as probably one of the greatest American poets. And again, she's very shy, very reclusive, and hardly anybody knows who she is during her life. But today we know her as one of the greatest American poets ever. Like poets, we begin to have novelists come on scene. You know, Washington Irving, some of my, I love these stories, Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Now, Washington Irving is from New York, and if you remember all the way back to August, who had settled New York originally, and it's the Dutch. And they have left a lot of legends, lots of stories behind. And uh, he really capitalizes on these uh, stories of the Dutch people. Rip Van Winkle, the guy that fell asleep for 20 years, and the legend of Sleepy Hollow, you know, the ghost, the dead Hessian officer who, you know, uh, runs into conflict with, uh, with the people of Sleepy Hollow. Great stories, by the way. And by the way, both of these books you can download for free. If you have a device, you can go into, uh, into a, you're not going to push any certain kind of public, you know, any kind of provider, but you, these books are available free. Now, James Fenimore Cooper, a great book. And also, here, by the way, is a picture of the movie, The Last of the Mohicans. He also wrote The Deerslayer. He kind of looks back at our kind of our, of our historical past, and he writes stories based... By the way, The Last of the Mohicans is during the French and Indian War. Great story, uh, and a good movie, too, if you want to watch that. So he kind of capitalizes on America... Uh, with its, you know, it, it really kind of glorifies America's past and relations with Native Americans. Okay, some other ones. Uh, Herman Melville, Moby Dick, a great story. You know, uh, you know, Captain Ahab, the crazy captain, you know, he's searching for this uh, whale that has bitten off his leg. Basically, it's a cautionary tale, you know, to be careful what, you know, don't let vengeance control your life because it's going to destroy him and his crew. But uh, kind of like Dickinson, when he wrote this book, he didn't get a lot of success. You know, it wasn't really well received. Today, we look at Moby Dick as one of the greatest uh, American novels ever written. All right? So, Edgar Allan Poe. This guy, you guys all know. I put him in the novelist, but he could also go into the poets as well because he kind of crossed genre. Edgar Allan Poe wrote some great, great horror stories. Even today. Even today with all, you know, the great horror stories you've seen or read. Edgar Allan Poe still is the master. You know, the Telltale Heart. Um, you know, wrote The Fall of the House of Usher, The uh, uh, the Murder in the Rue Morgue. Um, he was great. Now, interesting story too. You know, Edgar Allan Poe had been an orphan. He had been adopted by the Poes. He had gone to West Point. The United States Military Academy at West Point did not finish there. Um, he ended up dying in Baltimore. Some say that he uh, was an alcoholic. I'm not quite sure exactly how he died. But uh, today, even today, he's still considered one of the greatest horror novelists ever uh, that has ever lived. And he's an American. All right. Lastly, Nathaniel Hawthorne, he wrote The Scarlet Letter. Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote lots of stories uh, that dealt with the Puritans. The Puritans. Remember the people up in Massachusetts? The Scarlet Letter, um, they've remade that and... Um, yeah, I'm sure you've all either heard or seen the story about Easy A. That's horrible compared to the real story, The Scarlet Letter, where a woman is basically banished by the community because she's had an adulterous affair and she has to wear a big red letter A on her dress to know that she is an awful sinner. I always wonder what happened to the man, but you know, it's a man's world back then. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about are the transcendentalists. You know, this is a group of people that uh, believe that truths in life go beyond or transcend human reason. Uh, the most famous of all is Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he has this idea of individualism. He believes that uh, each person is, uh, is, an impo is an important. So think about slavery. Every human being is important. 
They're more important as individuals than as the collective group. Um, he said that each, you know, each, each person has an inner light, and he urged people to can you use this light to guide their lives and improve society. Remember, the, this is all social reform here. You know, so he is very important. Uh, many people flock from all over the country to hear him speak, and uh, he says, you know, uh, that we have to look to nature, you know, uh, to look and see what God has created. That nature exhibits higher values than than human race, humankind. All right. Okay, another uh, transcendentalist and also a friend of Ralph Waldo Emerson is Henry David Thoreau. All right, he believed that uh, urbanization and city life was was ruining society. Okay, ruining the nation. You know, he wants people to live simply uh, and as close to nature as possible. He wrote a book um, called Walden. And he says that each individual person has to decide what is right and what is wrong. Remember, during the Mexican-American War, Henry David Thoreau refused to pay taxes. He felt that the war was unjust, and he refused to pay taxes to a government for an unjust war. So he puts his actions into words. All right? Um, you know, um, he, he, again, also believes that slavery is evil, and he advocates for civil disobedience. You know, the idea that have... That people have to have the right to disobey an unjust law. Remember, that's why he refused to pay taxes during the Mexican-American War. All right, um, he because you know he looks at that at the Mexican-American War as a Southern conspiracy to add slave states. So he is absolutely against that. Uh, so Thoreau's writings on civil disobedience goes beyond his death. It's going to inspire uh, the idea of nonviolent protests to people like Dr. Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi. All right? So that's the Transcendentalists. Okay, so today we've talked about, you know, the women's rights movements and this um, kind of this, uh, you know, blooming of American culture with, with art and literature and Transcendentalists. All right? So there you have it. Read these chapters to get more information.